Hello and welcome to the module on access control and identity management. I'm Ben McGee and I'm going to be walking you through this. Hopefully you can hang on tight and get ready for a ride. First we're going to talk about radius and specifically talk a little bit about what that does and what you can do with that. Uh, it's really used for authentication. You know, The name itself implies that it's for uh, the dial-in, for the ability to use it. However, most of the time you see this in large networks. Uh, typically the internet service providers will provide the radius clients to be able to uh, see how much bandwidth you consume and be able to allow you to authenticate to their network through uh, whatever connection is available. The next one that we'll talk about here is the TACAX and it's, it's similar to the, the radius component. Um, Cisco uh, put it together uh, early on and created it to what's called the extended TACX to uh, or X TACX. But now currently they use the TACX Plus and it's used in the connection oriented protocol, the TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. Kerberos uh, in Greek mythology is known as the three headed gatekeeper dog of the underworld as seen over on the right hand side. Uh, typically, any questions that you see on the exam will talk about the uh, the tickets and maybe about port 88 whenever they're talking about Kerberos. Um, but essentially what happens is a user requests access to a service running on a server. The key distribution center or KDC authenticates the user and sends a request back with a ticket and allows that person access to a particular resource on the, the system. Microsoft uses Kerberos uh, authentication in most of their products. LDAP is uh, something that you will absolutely see on the exam. Typically a lot of different questions come in in that regard. A whole bunch of different flavors of the directory servers that are out there. Active Directory is one of them. Um, also, you know, Oracle is, is a big one out there. Apache, IBM, Apple all have skin in the game as well. Uh, the LDAP stands for the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol and really is a language and a, a way that you can uh, logically represent things in the x.500 schema or the directory information tree. It's gone over port 389 and the secure version of that is port um, 636. So uh, if you're using just a regular anonymous bind to an LDAP, it would be over port 389. If you wanted to use TLS or SSL LDAP, that would be over 636. So the big three A's, the triple A, the trifecta, if you will, in um, information security would be the authentication, authorization and access control. Um, not to be confused with the CIA triad, the CIA triad being the confidentiality, data integrity, and availability. So this AAA right here is, gets into specifics on access control. Um, what's the difference between identification and authentication? Identification typically is um, a user ID as opposed to um, something that is used to uh, be able to authenticate you, it would be something like a uh, uh, something you know, something you have, or something you are. And typically, any two of those uh, factor authentications, something you know, something you have, something you are, would be con considered multi-factor authentication or strong authentication. Authentication specifically in, in the components that we know of, something you know would be like a PIN or a password, maybe your mother's maiden name. Something you are would be biometrics. And something you have would be like a CAC card or a smart card, maybe an RSA token, one of those three things. Uh, and probably a plethora of other things. You know, biometrics definitely has some skin in that game as far as the authentication is concerned. Obviously, very difficult to spoof biometrics. Uh, there has been a few movies that have been out there that have done just that, but, uh, you know, in the real world, it typically is very difficult. 
there is a measure of sensibility called the FRR and the FAR, the false rejection rate and the false acceptance rate. And where those two meet typically in a biometrics product is called the crossover error rate. And those three typically show up on the exam uh, whenever we talk about biometrics. So the next one here on the bullets would be the tokens and the uh, very similar to the Kerberos concept that we talked about a little bit earlier in that the, uh, uh, the tokens can be used um, in a synchronous environment where uh, you, you may have a, a temporal token for maybe a 10 minute uh, period a lot of the the social media sites, uh, any banking will will use a session token to be able to to allow access to a particular uh, amount of objects for a specific amount of time. You know, with, to enumerate this a little bit further, if you've never seen a CAC card before, the Common Access Card, really it's a smart card. It's got a little chip inside of it that you can program. It's got a barcode that can be read. Usually it's got a, a facial, um, a front facial picture of the person and some sort of hologram or holographic mark on it uh, for the DOD service that it provides uh, for. Um, you know, we've also seen these personal identification verification, uh, the PIV cards, which have come out since September 11th, uh, that really helps to, um, um, with the, the HSPD 12, the Homeland Security Presidential Directive number 12, and uh, puts that in full effect. So a lot of times we see these two things on the exam as well, the, the mandatory access control, um, and the discretionary access control. So the mandatory access control is something that um, the administrators have to make changes and discretionary access control it means that you could make changes. Whoever owns the file could make the change. Um, it's at your discretion. And the way that you delineate between the two is mandatory could be something like a you know group policy or something along those lines. Whereas the, the DAC would be enforced by an ACL or access control list. Um, you know, usually Windows by default will make use of that DAC. The RBAC, the top one here, and I know both of these could be RBAC, role-based and rule-based, but typically you'll see the role-based access control, role-based access control, referred to as the RBAC. And uh, that is basically assigning access privileges to job functions and roles. So people are put into buckets. Those buckets are then uh, called roles, and those roles are assigned permissions to specific objects that are on the network um, that could be controlled through something like an Active Directory or you know like a, an LDAP directory of some kind. Um, down here at the bottom, the rule-based access control, we have uh, you know an, an allow or deny. Usually, you'll see an if-then-else um, rule-based access control. Easiest way to think about that is like your Windows firewall, or if you've ever played around with like IP tables or some sort of other firewall. Uh, you have implicit allows or implicit denies and explicit allows and explicit denies. Access control methods are uh, really, uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of them here. Uh, some of the ones that are of significant interest uh, that you will see, the, the practice of least privilege is something that um, is near and dear to my heart. I know a lot of times uh, people come two, three, four months after they start, and uh, especially some of the the C level people, and say, you know, why don't I have access to to a particular um, folder or you know printer or something on the network? And uh, you know, you have not because you ask not. Really, is what it comes down to with the the least privilege and the principle of least privilege. Uh, the, the separation of duties really helps uh, companies to have uh, uh, you know, redundant backup and personnel to make sure that there's no um, issues and, and people aren't doing things they shouldn't be doing, really to keep an honest person honest. Um, a few of these other ones that you see uh, out there, mandatory vacations, a lot of people actually uh, force their employees to, to take mandatory vacations because uh, it helps boost morale and 
uh, really keeps people more fresh as opposed to somebody who you know may not ever take vacations or you know has you know two three hundred hours worth of vacations that they've been bank rolling for a while so uh, companies are starting to enforce mandatory vacations more often to uh, make sure people remain sane the account management really is a uh, a function of itself and and can be um, uh, multiple people that could administer this. Uh, a lot of times you see nowadays, at least in the Windows server domains, with the, the PowerShell uh, starting to, to you know, go into some of the, the command line based Active Directory components for modifying group objects or group policy objects. Uh, you get to a point where you can enforce policies um, that could be things like password complexity, you know, have over 12 characters with, uh, you know, bumpy caps or, you know, camel case where, you know, upper and lower case as well as, you know, numbers and alphanumeric characters. Have expirations typically at 90 days you'll see for passwords. Um, you know, some sort of clipping level or threshold that can be met as well. Uh, if maybe, you know, somebody types the incorrect password, you know, three times, you lock them out for 15 minutes or, or something like that. Um, a lot of focus is put on some of the next slides here. The Bella Padula is one of them. Um, this is really specific to confidentiality. Bella Padula confidentiality. The, the premise here is that it has a lattice based approach with an upper boundary and a lower boundary. And information cannot leave those boundaries. So you have a no read up and a no write down for Bell La Padula. The upper boundary, the lower boundary, information can't leave and it's for confidentiality specifics uh, specifically for this particular one. The Biba, I like to say in my classes, the Biba Las Vegas just because it's an easier way to remember it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's for uh, the integrity. Um, you know, the, the, the Bell La Padula we just talked about was for confidentiality this one's for integrity and you know you have a limited use worth an upper and lower boundary uh, where you have no write up and no re read down in this case you know information could not um, be read down as well as you can't write up to maybe corrupt or damage the integrity of data on on the upper or lower bounds the Clark Wilson here it, it talks a little bit about the sensitivity and uh, how you know some of the the applications um, can have a very robust power um, based on the, the privileges of the account that's connecting to the database. Um, and it really sets, to, uh, for, sets forth uh, a lot of uh, value in adding some, some goodness to, um, what to what kind of access controls to put onto your applications, you know, driver code or program code, sensitive and public, you know, being able to read from the application and write from the application. What are those privileges? Are you logging that? Um, then those sorts of things are what comes with Clark Wilson. The information flow model is kind of neat. Uh, you know, you have different sensitivity labels that are over on the left-hand side here where you know, restricted, sensitive, limited. Um, you have the different information that's available here. And then an application that um, is able to uh, massage the data or you know, based, based off of the, the identification and authentication and the authorization of the person can make determinations on who can see what, when, and where for how long. Um, typically that is the information flow model. The non-interference is, is similar, um, but basically you, you, know, you have different pipes, you know, high class, low class, whatever the, the classified uh, information could be, uh, you know, restricted, limited, public, it stays in that particular swim lane and never the two shall meet. So it's an uh, easy way to think of this as like sipper and nipper. It's, it's totally segmented, no way to uh, interfere with each other. Uh, and that's basically it. Um, you've seen this on access control and identity management. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at ben.c.mcgee at gmail.com.